and I want to start with just a moment of silence to recognize that we're on native lands. All right, thank you so much. All right, first and foremost, this is the 11th annual Solstice Poetry Reading. Hey, Krista. Good to see you. Um, I want to start by saying that we have this anthology available out there. Many of you have already purchased copies. If you have not, please do. This is Sun and Shadow, Wood and Stone. This is the 10th anniversary anthology. So it contains, what is it, 61 poets from the 10 years that we've done this. So not this year, but the 10 previous years that we've done this. Um, blood, sweat, and literal tears were poured into this book from every different <laughs> angle. And it came just in the nick of time. So we are so happy to share with you uh, all the proceeds that will be going both to Glen Helen and to the Tecumseh Land Trust. So on that note, I would like to jump into thank yous. And I would like to thank, first and foremost, the Tecumseh Land Trust. It is the main reason that we are here. It is one of the reasons that I am here. Is this interesting intersection, right, of poetry and land preservation that we're at here. And so excited to be here. And on that note, I need to thank particularly um, Ed Davis and Ann Randolph. Um, they are part of a subcommittee that I'm on that really put all of this together. Everything that you see here, um, in one way, shape, or another, the three of us made happen, including this book. So cheers, you two. Um, thank you so much. It's been a while. I also just want to thank the Education Committee in general and Bethany Gray, our chair. Where is Bethany? She's around here somewhere. Thank you so much. Jordan is manning the film this evening. Um, also, thank you to um, Dayton Daily News. They put out a couple different articles letting everybody know about the event, and Riley Dixon at the Yellow Springs News, who I got to meet and hang out with, and he's a great human being. Just fact of the matter. He's not able to join us, sadly, but um, hopefully in years to come he will be here again. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Michelle Burns and Betty on up here, and we would like to um, just talk a little bit about the Tecumseh Land Trust as well as the Glen Helen Association. So please. from the much-awaited poetry. I just wanted to thank you all for being here. It's so nice to be back in person and not on Zoom. Um, so welcome back. Uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, Tecumseh Land Trust. Most of you know is a land preservation organization. We hold a conservation easement on all of Glen Helen. So uh, this collaboration goes hand in hand with our everyday work that, that we collaborate with Glen Helen on. Um, and I think Matt covered all the housekeeping items, so that's wonderful. But, uh, oh, well, I think everyone knows where the restrooms are in the hallway. Um, at intermission, we will have snacks and wine and coffee and desserts, so, um, you know, hang on. And there is an open mic sheet out in the hallway if anyone wants to sign up who hasn't. Um, otherwise, I would just like to say, Betty, would you like to say a few words? Yes, let me say there's plenty of chairs up here. Yeah, please. Come Laura's on. getting chairs out in the back but again, and please. there's lots of places over here. Anyway, um, I feel very fortunate to have always been able to attend this and volunteer for it. Um, I was a Glen Helen staff member for 30 years at the Raptor Center, and um, I am now on the Glen Helen Association board, but I'm also on the TLT board. So it's a it's really wonderful complementary organizations and as Michelle said uh, TLT holds an easement the conservation easement on all of the Glen and that was very exciting when that happened and it when was that what year was that it, it, it well, it wasn't that many years ago. I remember being but at that celebration. But it took celebration. 10 years to took do it. took 10 years to actually do it. So that's one of the wonderful things. And I think most of you might be familiar with what the Glen does and having our over 1,000 acres for hiking, um, wonderful, you know, different things going on, the Outdoor Education Center, uh, Eco Camps, the Raptor Center, uh, all kinds of activities that are here. So um, we have memberships for both organizations, and I think there's a way to join uh, while you're here for either the Tecumseh Land Trust or Glen Helen Association. But we're glad to welcome you back to the Glen. 
again. And I think it was still a really good uh, event when it was on Zoom, but um, there's something about being in person too. So, and Ed Davis is in the Glen every day, I believe. And so you are going to, I thought, hey, we've got to get back to the Glen. So welcome, we're glad to have you here. so much, Betty and Michelle. Um, format, it's all up here. I'm not going to reread re it, but I will let everybody know that five minutes is just like a friendly little like reminder. Um, you can go a little bit longer, you can go a little bit less. We're not going to hold you to that specifically. Um, the open mic is out in front. Um, to kick it off, we're going to go in reverse alphabetical order. Our first reader would have been William Stoll's Bill. Bill is not able to join us this evening. He had to work, which is important, right? You know, food, money, all these good things. So he actually sent me his work, and I'm going to read it for him. I hope that I do it justice. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. This is Bill Stoll's. Um, he told me to say that he chose these three poems really because um, they were all historically significant to him. Um, I found that it was interesting that he said that because as a poet myself, I don't know that I would bother writing something that wasn't historically significant to myself in some way, shape, or form, but suffice it to say, um, the first poem is called Fall. A late autumn day, Indian summer has come, the sky splendid blue, the warm air filled with the scent of flowers not yet captured by frost. Voices drift through the red brick of campus, nestled among the drifting leaves and cool shadows, a group of Mennonites clad in simple hues of blue, white, and black sing hymns. So ethereal and harmonious, the world pauses for a brief moment, overwhelmed by the sound of peace echoing off the cold stone. Good one, Bill. The next one is called Winter Morning on Ninth Street. Bitter cold bites the flesh as eyes peer from a fleece covered head hunched low against the winter chill. Ninth Street. Ruler straight from north to south stands empty in the morning light. Frost-covered autos bisect the avenue in search of warmth. Shadows recede back to their dark cracks and crevices as the easterly sun advances. The scent of fresh bread and coffee lingers in the air as bundled figures dart in and out of glass doorways. The morning has begun anew. And the last one is actually one that I published. I am the editor of a local publication called The Mock Turtle Zine. And this one appeared in The Mock Turtle Zine. I didn't, I didn't tell Bill to do that, right? Just saying. Um, this one's called Goodbye, and this one sings flat out. Goodbye. Boxes. Twelve total neatly stacked on the tan carpet. Some sealed. Others overflowing with porcelain madonnas kneeling in silent prayer and wrapped safely in paper towels where all that remained of her, even the familiar smell was gone, replaced by the piney scent of cleaning solution. Downstairs, the urn sits on the kitchen table, staring out the office window, my back to the boxes, the house silent in the late winter morning. I feel like a thief. Thank you so much, Bill, for sending those in. Our next up is Rose Smith. But, sadly, I do not see Rose here tonight. She should be here any minute now. She should be here any minute now. And you know what we're going to do? 
just go right ahead, and then we'll come back and table that for a moment. So next up, poet, Ricky Santer. Will you please join us up here? Also, while you're coming up here, be careful. There's a delicate system that I have in place. Um, it's really just this one chord. You'll be fine. Right, you do need to enter this side. Yeah. That's Good evening, everybody. Matt, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here, and thank you for the Tecumseh Land Trust and all the folks at Glen Helen. What a beautiful venue. I've been here many, many times, uh, and it's just a joy to be here with all of you. I'm going to read three poems. Um, this first one is about where I live, uh, and it's called This Backyard Ravine. And, and by the way, I should say in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> this backyard ravine, tall with trees, creature unto itself, is an opening sequence for a David Lynch film, <laughs> sinew for haiku poets, reason for teeming, I invent ideas for closer readings. A Japanese toilet house in the moss grove, lightning bugs that fly in formation, coon cam. A childhood neighbor appears, lured back by a patch of snapdragons. Their petals, his finger puppets, Butter and fuchsia understudies for his stuttering. His intentions were always crippled to be a boy more verdant than I'd let him. The freeway din squeezes in through folds of silence and the whisker thin places of empty. Oh, it's nice to hear. Mm. <laughs> it's, I mean, this it just beats being on Zoom, you know? <laughs> so we were all breathing together. It's wonderful. All right, this next poem, um, and we're, okay, here it is. Yeah. I book one. Okay, I got it. Um, trees, oh gosh. Glen Helen is so rich with trees, and trees kind of define the places of our lives. This poem is about that. It's called Arboreal. When the March storm couldn't spare punches and our front yard elm snapped in half, its broken body collapsed across the driveway. The luxuriant crown sprawled across the wet black rasped for lost sustenance. Impotent, I watched from the window and notched my life with yet another tree, billowing pink bouffants of dogwoods that intoxicated my young daddy, the weeping willows that forgave my parents' fights, my brother and I crawling under skirts of cul-de-sac, giant pine, our secret club, for beheaded Barbies and stolen cigarettes. First kiss along the river in the sticky hollow of an oak's furry bosom, my mother's glow as confidant. The sheltering pin oak that won my father's heart when he made his first down payment for an abiding couple's grave. Sentinel twin maples that celebrated my homecoming from every morning run. Three witness oaks murdered by our next door neighbor, grieving crows for days. Each spring, tree men troll to our front door and swagger with chainsaws for interment of our broken elm. But we adore our stubby, pippy long stocking in ballerina's fifth position, buoyant branches sprouting for the sun. And the last poem that I'm going to read is actually from my new collection. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, and I am so proud. I, we had Mill Creek Park, was like your Glen Helen. All right, who? Struthers. All right, yes. 
sister, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Great. Uh, and I spent a lot of time as a kid in Mill Creek Park. Um, and so I felt this was kind of a sister park to Glen Helen. That's why I chose to read it today. It's called Creekside. Last night, my mother made treaty with the monster under my bed. The front yard pine needles nest in my hair because I won't give up on keeping tally of fireflies. Mouse pops out of the toaster, magic streaks across the counter as I grab two squares of butter cake and stuff them into my backpack. Pink Schwinn, my Mustang, that I ride at odd angles through the neighborhood or park at the mouth of a path to hike down to harvest echoes at the toes of waterfall. Today brims with girl knowledge. My pocket knife, willow whistle, a tattered library book about Annie Oakley, who seems to be west of everything except this creekside. Her episodes spider down. She's that handprint in the bark, a birthday action figure with a string that pulls on legacy. I want to braid her an ivy crown, aim her 22 caliber to the sky, sip from her loving cups. Through breeze, stay, sitting bull whispers her Lakota name for her little sure shot with both eyes open. Someday I'm going to get me a fancy pair of cowboy boots, but in the meantime, I've got to get home. Late for casserole, pine needles still jagging my hair, and something else I won't give up on, the palindrome of my mother's chest scars, targets where her breasts used to be. Thank you. so much. Um, FYI, there will be an intermission in between the readers and the open mic, and there are poetry books out there for sale. So I'm hoping, Ricky, that the book you were just reading from is out there somewhere. I've lost you. Um, okay, the next reader this evening is going to be Amy Noel. Amy, without further ado. choosing to spend your evening here um, among these words. My first poem, I always uh, try and challenge myself to write on the topic. Um, so this is fresh, so be kind. Okay. <laughs> Why bother? My students ask me with their postures, their empty papers, their silence. Why bother? There's nothing new to say, they say, like the students for 30 years before them. They have nothing to add, and no one's listening anyway. They knock their heads against the low ceiling of this small town, where anything they shout is answered by the rustle of corn husks littered among the sheared stalks post-harvest. They chafe against their own reflections repeated in every classroom, every store, every sidewalk, yet are in no hurry to get out there, to set the world on fire. It already is, they tell me. And what can I say? I googled open air, and 4,370,000 replies slapped back in half a second. The task of being 4,300,070 and one weighs heavy on my pen. 
But stars don't look around to compare their brilliance to those beside them. They shine on, throwing their whole being into brightness. Scatter your soul across the canopy of the open air, I vow to tell my students. Someone will set their sights on your specific shine. Um, this next poem is about um, chimney swifts, and so I'm so glad to be able to read them in a community that recently spoke out for the chimney swifts, and um, so go Yellow Springs. And, um, and thank you to Wiso, who decided to build a tower to save the swoop um, as they're rebuilding their schoolhouse. And if you don't know about that, I'd be happy to talk about it ad nauseum during intermission. The nightly show of chimney swifts above Ed Smith's flower shop. Show me how to watch in wonder these triangle points swelling to the same allegro lifting their wings. They glide and trill, glide and trill. The sky flushes pink with the dusky flurry of it. I have lost the ability to see magic. I need Virgil's inverse to guide me through these heavenly circles like animated confetti, flushing meals out of the air, adept at life on the wing. The pessimist in me imagines a future Peruvian swoop having flown 6,000 miles only to become a confused cortege circling above rubble or vacancy. Remind me instead of the silent call which signals their synchronized dive. Nightly, fingers of clouds reflecting orange ember funnel their impossible numbers into this chimney. Let me remain eyes straining toward the open air until I am sure the last swift has swept in, its talons and tail bristles clinging to centuries old mortar. Help me imagine half-saucer half nests of sticks and spit, and next year's migration being born. And this uh, last poem is about Kamama Prairie, which is an area of the, in the Ark of Appalachia, and I see some of you nodding, so that's great. Um, I wrote this poem for my friend Adrian, who was a steward for some time at Kamama. Centuries ago, when this short grass prairie was wild sown, who could have known the balance this Ark of Appalachia would hold? Kamama, Cherokee for butterfly, this cedar glade beckons wing rarities to its barrens. A moonscape ripe for cobweb skivers and olive hair streaks that take to this place most others find too dry to land. As loath as I am to insert myself into this space or this poem, I walk the paths with a pack of questions that only the language of nature can understand. How do roots keep hold, I wonder, in soil so shallow that one hot breath could send the powdery foundation skyward? The depth of their tendrils is rewarded, of course, by the gathering built when rock crests and blazing star adapt to shells of rocky shale, and prairie gentian claims desire lines that nothing else desires. The orchid's bulbous, excuse me, the orchid's bulbous labellum shines just the same. It cares not a whit for the lady or the slipper for whom it is named just spirals yellow-green petals outward and stakes its claim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Next up, my seatmate, Gary Mitchell. because I was thinking of open space, and the biggest open space I could think of was Salisbury Plain. Mm -hmm. And I just watched on PBS a program called The Ghosts of Stonehenge. And so 
I thought of this poem that I wrote when my wife and I hitchhiked across the Salisbury Plain. It's called The Blue Stones. We headed for a blue more monumental than we had ever expected. Only bluish gray and dry weather, while rain washed us to pale tourists. With rain, there is blue tinge, rubbed and polished with human oil. We were the stones, towering, separated, buried where we stood. Deliberate transport had rolled us here to stand our impermanence next to some 80-odd stones, an abstract architecture of our past. A circle of uprights floated here on slow water by companions on dry ground sledges built to conquer all distance. Driven to run fierce tide races, told to compete with whirlpools and eddies, we too had survived like skin stretched on articulated frames. For us, no altar stone, no primitive reason to want monuments erected by handiwork obliterated with piercing dust. Our temple was the blue hardness in our hands. And then I found another poem which I've never read before. I don't even know when I wrote this poem. I don't even know what I was thinking. <laughs> but I thought I might read it and afterwards you can tell me what it's about. It's called To Home. As each brick crumbles from the daily demolition, home, somewhere you are going. The houses along the way open their doors for the sun ray moment. The hope to avoid the dark room at the end of the route. Every daydream evaporates some of your memory. Plans change with added stones, while oceans claim the address one minute, seconds later the street posted on the mountain's sides. Through a telescope, the home you thought you saw in the looking glass. The body held temporarily in position. A survey locates the terrain of everything uneven, confused. Your friends dissatisfied with their space, so your place anxiety normal. You look at your feet to question them about the trek they have not taken. Instead, a mirror placed beneath you throws mud in your direction. The earth, not the home, a, mag a microscope would magnify. They converge on the slide of your past, slimy to the point of adhesion. You see them, and you are them. Tiny creatures calling your name. Buildings with personalities. Microorganisms scattering to search for the way out. Cells divided into cells, becoming rooms where you begin to arrange the furniture. Thank you. Daydreams evaporate memory. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm not going to have a lot of memories left. <laughs> I hope that's not the case, Terry. <laughs> Bad luck for me. Uh, next up, Kip. Kip Nutt. director at Antioch University for three years and I would, we live in Delaware, Ohio, which is like an hour and a half away. And so just to break up the monotony of the drive, I would drive her in two or three times a week. I've never been here. <laughs> for three years I came here and I've never been here, so this place is amazing and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to read uh, four very short poems and, and one poem that's not long, but it's not short either. Um, this first poem, it's, uh, the, it's the oldest poem in this book, um, and it, 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 it's, 
It's a poem that um, when I wrote it, somebody said, oh, you are ripping off James Wright. And I was like, who's James Wright? <laughs> I hadn't ever read James Wright before. Um, and then once I did, I thought, yeah, actually I did kind of rip him off. <laughs> um, this is called At Dusk. The barns of Ohio are dying under the weight of smoke. Fields are littered with remains Ribs, spines, dried and weathered skins. A horse grazing on lashes of honeysuckle curling from a cow's skull turns for home. Something in the wind is hungry. So I'm sorry, James. Uh, this poem's called Songs. There are songs that whittle away the dark, flickers of light rising through the air, owls, crickets, the high whine of a fox. We call and call all night, afraid to listen for a reply. Even the stars sometimes hum. This is peak summer evening. Nothing stirs the quiet moments between birds and tree frogs. A silo light blooms to life, fanning out its yellow dress across silkless corn. Broad green leaves shudder, a field away, a freight train chatters. This poem, um, next poem I'm going to read it. It's sort of my biggest accomplishment <laughs> in a way. Um, I, pu I published this poem in Yankee Magazine back when Yankee Magazine used to publish poetry. And every year Yankee does the best of Yankee. They pick the best poems that year. And I got third with this poem. But the thing that was so great about it was honorable mention was Jane Kenyon. <laughs> And I love her story. I mean, she is a big reason why I became a poet. And her poem, Twilight After Hang, is the first poem I ever had a visceral reaction to. And so when I wrote a poem that was just a notch above hers, I thought, hmm, okay. <laughs> so this is called The Coyote. Somewhere among the grasses stunted this summer by drought, a coyote's cry rises through the night like echoes we send into space for everyone or no one to hear. I step lightly into the dark field, testing the firmness of the parched ground, and walk toward the sound of an animal I have always looked for but never found. The moon and stars come and go like searchlights. Wispy spiderwebs catch on my legs, trail behind me like shadows cast in the dark. I sit and strip off their silk, silver threads clinging to my fingers and palms. I rise through the night in moonlight, my hands glow. And then this last poem, this is uh, from my first uh, full-length book uh, with, with a really upbeat title, uh, Tragedy, Ecstasy, Doom, and so on. <laughs> I can't claim that. That's a quote from Mark Rothko, because there's a section in the book of uh, Mark Rothko uh, of Prastic Poems. But um, I'll, I'll read one. This is about as upbeat as this book gets, and I'm sorry it's not all that upbeat, but um, I'll read it anyway. It's called A Walk After the Evening News. The whole world seems off kilter. Even birds overhead fly at jagged diagonals suturing the sky until the sun warms only the backs of clouds. Around me, the papery skins of birch trees slough off in long strips about my feet, exposing bare and vulnerable trunks. Carved into the face of one lightning dead sycamore, someone's name gapes as if trying to shout, hello, or goodbye, or help, I quickly move on before the lightning that struck it strikes me. I slump on a log to get my bearings. 
but the world descends upon me like notes in a minor key, disconnecting me from myself until I am a silent drone, untethered, alone, spying on the man I used to be, the man who always knew his way back home. Mash of styles we've had so far. <laughs> Kev, I don't know if you read Dennis Johnson. Yeah, nodding. Okay. Whoa. Anywho, thank you. On to our next reader. Ariana, you join us up here? Thank you. you, it would have been bad enough to have to follow Jane Kenyon. <laughs> I have a system too, if I'm messing up yours. It's okay, it can be repaired. Yeah, if I have my glasses, but I only thought, okay, got it. All right, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off on sort of solid ground, so can I close this? Yeah. And, um, and then... <coughs> I'm going to do something I've never done, which is read a brand new poem. Um, I've always considered it a bad idea to do so, but um, I'm going to do this in honor of my friend Stephanie um, Russell, who used to be so brave as to read or to write while others were uh, reading, and they were always amazing poems, which kind of upset me, frankly. <laughs> but um, this will not be amazing. It'll probably be kind of crazy, but it'll be my second poem. So. We'll start off with um, a poem kind of for the season and, uh, and kind of for a couple of seasons, I guess. It's called Caribou. Passion Sunday and the wrong season to be this dull, dreaming you. You, North American reindeer you, light tripping through some field or other. I want to wear you, be worn by you. Nuzzle into that place between skin and bone. Nest there on holiday. I even bought an Easter dress, airy fabric, the color of hot chocolate, of your hide, a velvet sash at the waist. My hand dreams your velvet muzzle. My fingers trail down your face. And I want to feed you passion fruit, papaya, persimmon, pulpy mangoes, sugar plums, wild strawberries, something fleshy, rich, unneeded. When I can't sleep, it's you I'll count, leaping your tinseled arch over my bed and back again. I would open you up, crawl in the husk of you, live in the gray brown skin of you until it dissolved, would stay longer, until your bones bleached white, until we evaporated, dust fine, mingled and scattered. I mean, I'd hide in your hide if I could. Let me crawl in your pocket, wander the heart of the deepest woods, sip from the same stream, soar a December night, rooftop landings, bells ringing, I want the whole garland draped lie. I mean, let me stay. Sunday morning, and I'm on a plane bound for nowhere fast or anywhere but here. Like you, Christmas feast, my timing sadly off. You're a far cry from home, and I'm a long way off. I left you a note that reads, they don't call you Dasher for nothing, but I'm not laughing. By now you'd think we'd learn. Still we wander where we don't belong, find ourselves flying fast on the wrong day, in the wrong country, headlong and into the wrong, headlong into the wrong dream, as if we care. Okay, I'm, apparently tonight's gonna be a weird animal poem night. Um, <laughs> I just looked down and I was like, oh boy. Um, but this next poem, the only thing you probably need to know is if you don't have alpaca, and if you don't, I feel very sorry for you. Um, they're, uh, they're really beautiful. Um, they may not be so bright. You can fool them if they get out by like a bunch of people just putting their arms out and they think a fence is just coming for them. Um, so uh, the working title of this is 10% um, Harvest. Outside, three alpaca arrange and rearrange themselves in the pasture. Silhouette, wisteria, yaya, the bay black, 
the beige and light fawn girls spot the gate swung open, the fence still down, and they bolt. The rain slows, the trees stay put. The woman picks up a branch in each arm, imitating a fence, and tries to steer the graceful creatures back to their field. I'm watching the woman, hurried and hairy, a flannel shirt exactly the color called emerald, her favorite muck boots, knee high, laced up, the word Roma imprinted on their face. And she stomps through manure grass. She's running and running late, story of my life choking back, tears of frustration, and she's me, watching her, watching me, 10 years from now, maybe 15, knowing more will be stripped from her then than now, the ridiculous scarecrow she is, her twigged arms hanging out four feet from her on each arm, and the alpaca, eyeing a full 50 feet of missing fence, do the math with their eyes and dart right, then left, a comedy quartet, alpaca, 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 scarecrow, middle-aged woman, clown, until finally, clumsily, she corrals them back. Didn't I just learn how the Greeks think of nostalgia as returning to one's pain, the return shed of its initial ache? I knew I'd look back cinematically, the way I imagined the holidays of others, their vacations, all lit in charmed light, social media's curio cabinet, the full harvest of what is will to be made gorgeously visible. How we once joked that Ghost Ranch farmed ghosts, but then said, no, they heard ghosts. Hard because invisible. Mm -hmm. How they then must have tossed wedding, how must, how, sorry. How they must then toss wedding veils over the pasture, hoping to catch their forms. Hold them in the vapor of the moment. Fabric so thin, it's 90% wish. It's a good sound <laughs> for a brand new phone. Um, and then I'd like to end with a poem called. Actually, I'm going to do two because they're kind of short and I can't decide which one. Um, I'll do a eulogy for a morning cloak butterfly because it fits the theme so well. Dearly beloved, we are scattered here like anywhere, raging against the radiator whose cry kept us awake night after night after our wings brittled, our hearts folded into newspaper ship hats, delivered as cape of great sorrow, no matter the address, attended every trumpet flower, loved to flitter. <coughs> Remember thusly, best to wear one thing well, in lieu of flowers, flowers. Do this last one, um, because again, wings and air. Glean. You maybe haven't seen it in my eyes, but that's all right by the wren's cry, all right by me. There is a heron in a hush of lift, and my eyes are filled with it. Plus the plumage of a thousand water birds. Add the damage, damage of the cat's teeth as they mouth words to bird flesh, as they speak afterglow and loom, and journey out and arc away, as to go luminous in your going, as to go out where the us trees don't grow out to the bus stop carved in stone where a mineral mother clutches a rock baby until her arms crumble. She maybe hasn't seen the marquee pupil of the sorry cat's eye, the long gleam, the star's key that unlocks the night sky, lets out a ream of morning paper, the light of the sun, a scream forming at the back of dawn's throat, ripples out, a stone's throw from the stone woman, the infant, clutched in a blanket carved from rock. Each fold holds a river of history, cemented and old, colder than the bird's rush over silver water, the granite woman, her petrified daughter. You see, I meant to mention the loon, mournful and mooning, a sound still burning from the Empyrean room, an altitude beyond us. The loon bids goodbye with every note song. Thank you.
try not to get my glass confused with your glass. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you very much, Matt and the Tecumseh land, and all of the people here for coming out tonight. I'm a novelist who loves poems and poets and who aspires to join that wonderful group. And tonight, I'm going to share two poems that I have, um, that are part of a collection that I'm working on. The collection is called Skin, a Memoir in Verse. And of course, the obligatory glasses. The first poem is titled, Back to the Garden. The tomato vines hang leafless, unripe fruit dangling over the red cages above a snail shell unearthed by the hose curved blade. The dirt, skinned of its green flesh, lies bare, and now I, no longer sowing, carve out dead roots, rescuing the last of the spring onions, ever mindful of the mystery snake that strayed into my garden plot, shed its too tight skin, and then moved on. One bed, already stripped of its epidermic crop, slumbers. The other waits, still dressed in summer pajamas, parsley stalks resurgent, holding courtly talks with wasps and spiders. I remove my gloves to rake the soil with chilled fingers, my self-exile at an end eager to reforge the connection, the lost Edenic bond. This poem has an epigraph from William Shakespeare's Macbeth. The poem is titled, Soul Stitch, Sleep That Knits Up the Raveled Sleeve of Care. The year crawls close to dying, the light, pale as the day, claims fewer hours to confront the sere consequence of autumn's fickle rain, counts fewer moments to weave memory into grace. Weary, I fumble through the dawn orations, rise early to turn the birdbath upside down, rake wayward leaves into ragged mounds, shear feather grasses to an invernal state of mind. My hair, unbound, rides a chill wind, while the inside cat drowses on the sill, and a beaver, undeterred by darkness, swims the tideless water of the drought-cursed pond. I should despair for all the fair, now withered, old and broken, like my faith in happy endings, numb in the cold awareness of eclipsing life. Yet I do not feel defeated, for in dusk's caress I sense a promise, not of annihilation, but rebirth. One running stitch to close the seam, to knit the bruised and broken skin a sleeve again. Thank you. Final reader, Betsy Hughes. Uh, the first poem I'll read is actually comprised of three sonnets, and um, the first of those I composed years ago for this occasion, and then the next two. I composed very recently, have never shared them, and they were written specifically with the theme of open air in mind. And the three parts to the poem are called Invocation, Invitation, and Inspiration. The title of the whole, In the Glen tonight. <laughs> One, invocation. 
We do not fear that briefest time of light, the winter solstice, which occurring soon cannot defy December hopes so bright. While poets gather here with rhyme and rune to celebrate forever in the glen, where always wind and water, earth and sun, remind us of the elements again and their inspiring spirits freely run, infusing us with nature's holy muse. The breath of wind, the lyric waterfall, the fertile loam of earth, the flaming news, these forces of the true transcendent all. We humbly offer poetry of place because environment is sacred space. Two, invitation. Come walk with us upon this open road, which leads directly into open air. Upon our journey, Whitman will bestow his courage, caring, and his dauntless dare. Take off your shoes. Feet bared, you'll surely feel the ground. You'll forge connection with the earth, a bond with nature that can help you heal by touching soil and seeds of death and birth. The child's bold question was, what is the grass? The poet answered, it is hopeful green. Democracy, when practiced, will surpass closed-mindedness, intolerance obscene. These trails and paths preserved in countryside renew our faith in humankind our pride. Three, inspiration. Here, activists for freedom, civil rights, the abolitionists and Quakers breathed this open air where daring dreams took flight and diverse populations were bequeathed. Here, Shawnee spirits whisper in the trees. We must not desecrate their holy land. Respect for nature is a trust that frees, and reverence for earth is the command. Here, drink from wholesome waters, yellow springs. Medicinal ingredients restore the health imbibe, and inspiration brings a vision for the future, thirst for more. Invoke, invite, inspire. These vital three protect the fragile earth for you and me. And I'd like to end with um, a poem called Invocation to the Mad River so that you won't think that I write just sonnets. <laughs> Invocation to the Mad River. I summon your Shawnee spirit. Hear me, Hathanithapi, inspire me, mad muse. Let me fish in your fertile streams. Permit me to meditate on your sacred banks. Allow me to absorb your ancient wisdom. May I breathe your exhalation of surreal mist. May you surrender your supernatural stones, upturn the fossil faces. May I conjure your demons and divinities to interpret these runes. Toss me into your turmoil and tumult. Churn me in your turning, crazy currents. Immerse me in your fantasies and insane imaginings. Move me by your mighty madness. 
wash my words in worlds of waters. Destroy me and create me anew. I drown in the depths of your fierce floods. I feel your forever flux and rock with its rhythms. I am uplifted by your lyric liquidy. Now I meet the mouth of the great Miami. Take me, I float, I flow. The mad river runs through me. Nature's power to inspire is certainly what's been, what you have gathered here tonight. Thank you. This first poem is called um, and I, I wrestle, I'm wrestling with myself over what to read. So I'll be honest with you guys. I don't write uh, nature very often. It may appear in the poem. Um, and Matt called me or wrote me and said, he had asked me, could I read it this reading? And then he sent the invitation and it said, the theme is open air. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> um, this one is called Walnuts on the Ground. In 88, the uncles sold off dozens of hard worked acres from the family farm, peddled them out to home builders, primed for a buck, maybe for many did not bid them sift through autumn quiet for the fall of walnuts from dark forgotten branches. Heirs, no longer children, had played in the aging trees, fruit scattered pastures, pelted each other's backs with the hardened hulls. Heirs, oblivious to the seed inside. What sail could not close as quickly as well-oiled hinge they deeded in small portions to those of us who'd sprung from womb and loin. So many sons, 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 daughters, with red dust on our hands. Mother called us owners as we watched her once live hands tremble over cornbread, thick smoked ham and grains, her knuckles sharp and prominent high neck tilted forward. We could not see the scars where her lover, stranger's words cut her years ago, so slightly open in the flesh, so deeply open in heart, she'd take a lifetime to fold new skin over that raw edge and still not recover. Stockholm Syndrome, they call the way the broken hold helplessly onto love unspoken, first offenses so much like this hardwood fruit, fresh fallen, how at just right ripe, the soft hull pulls away from nat ribbed shell, its inner hardness born to hold secrets inside, how a short blade laid against a vein to bleed away forevers, layers them over in decades of retreat. Your long, loud scream, the rough, rough scrub of excuses until the shell breaks. Um, as much as 
I don't write often about nature. I do often I do sometimes encounter it. This poem uh, occurred in a moment of deja vu, therefore having its name, deja vu. These few things I will take with me over the road that bends, over the soft hill there that grays against horizon, the whisper of wind on my face, the silk feel of the amnion, the soft kiss of the ancients smiles upon my weariness. The ripple of moving air dance across bowed fronds of emerald grass. Memories remembering places I had not yet been. The soft kiss of the ancients smiles upon my weariness. The hope to find again right light, right scent on autumn breeze. Right dream, to crack the sealed flask of a moment held in this mind or the next, pour out again its secrets on tomorrows, set aside to intimate a life once lived, before I ventured out from water, before I breathed this cool night air. This uh, last poem, I think it's all I have time for. I'm not sure. Um, hmm? <laughs> okay. Um, so I am going to read a poem that uh, probably uh, could stand to be workshopped a great deal more. Uh, <laughs> But I live uh, by the woods, and this poem is called By the Woods at Midnight. Tomorrow sings through my blood like animal fat over red coal fire, little notes unnameable, familiar by their minute whistles, throats open toward the night, starlight popping in the great backdrop of blue, obscured horizon. So I usher this tomorrow through my quiet space like a lover. I tell it where to hold me, how to hold, pull me closer, push its hands lower till it blushes. It blows a warm breeze over me and windowsill. Soft trill and moan ascend in the still tonight. I listen to the woods, marvel at so many constant voices, have found this a lover who will return each day, the moment sun pulls back its hand, an open flame. And this last poem uh, is called White Chunk. I have to say this <laughs> because I used to um, um, workshop at Pudding House. I uh, worked at Pudding House and workshop at Pudding House uh, for several years, and um, Kathy Callahan, um, an amazing poet, um, one of the only poems of mine she ever read and wrote yes on. So, <laughs> she was amazing. And um, <clears throat> so I do this poem in her honor because she came to mind. Um, around this thing, white trunk. Birch encounters winter with uncanny abandon within the crowd of gray-stroked 
maple warriors stripped free of their common robes. The cold rep finds her waiting naked and voyeur, foreground of it all, caressing the underbelly of December sky with tireless, nimble hands. flask of this moment uh, together. I think this is absolutely fantastic. We'll take a short break and intermission. There's wine, cheese, um, other goodies, and most importantly, there are some books out there for sale. We'll come back and do an open mic after that. So thank you so much, everyone. My favorite part, especially we have we have an extraordinary lineup here for the open mic as well. Um, yeah, I think that one thing that I forgot to do earlier, and I'm just going to take time to do it, is introduce myself. <laughs> hey everyone, I am Matt Birdsall, and I am the host for this evening. Uh, I'm a board member for, Deco for the Cups of Land Trust. I am a local writer. I also run um, one of the local publications called the Mock Turtle Zine. We have a bunch of other stuff too, like children and all kinds of fun things. But um, suffice it to say, I'm just really excited to be here and grateful to be here. Um, when I was interviewing with Riley with the Yellow Springs News, he was like, you know, what's your connection to the Glen? I was like, oh my gosh, I've been going there since I was uh, like a child, like a young boy. And I remember one of my, you know, favorite things that I done, did in grade school is I came to the Glen as a part of the outdoor education center for a week, right? Mm -hmm. With your sixth grade class, and there's no, there's no parents, and if anything goes, and somebody's wet in the bed every night, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It was an outstanding, we had like a ping pong tournament. Suffice to say, again, I love this place. I'm really excited that we could be here again, and I think that everybody agrees that in person is always better than, than virtual, except for the fact that I like, could be not wearing pants, which would be optimal. Um, so maybe like an in-person pantsless poetry party. I don't know if we can organize that. Um, either way, kick this off. Stella Ling will be our first reader for the open mic. Um, three to five minutes, everyone. Three to five minutes. It's all you, Stella. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Matt, for organizing such an amazing lineup of poets. I just felt so happy to be here tonight. And uh, also thank you to Ed Davis, who has been uh, doing this for so many years. And uh, a few years ago, he invited me to uh, read as a poet here, and he now has an anthology out, and this is the poem that I uh, have in his anthology. So uh, it's called Winter Solstice. <clears throat> Once a year, the shortest day becomes the longest night. The embryos of thought abort as the wan, lonely sun of winter, withered and bewitched, utters its last howl and slinks to bed. The trees bare of leaves droop over rest. Nests abandoned in black wave tipsy in high branches. We weather the turning of the year, the stretch of axis, the bad assness of gluttonous night. Over the rooftops of creation, the amaze of stars, flashes, symbols, and celestial spheres clash. Galaxies pour over black holes, the lines of energy like fine floss, etched and spiraling ever outward. We do our part solemnly in glacial dress as the failed day like wet oatmeal gives obeisance to the night. 
the mysteries of death and rebirth reverberate in druid chants and New Year's salutation. We all sleep, the crucified touching each other with their scarred beaks, the unrequited lovers muttering and holding themselves tight, the brothers and sisters stroking the hands of their mothers, the fathers pausing in their beards, their teeth full of snow, wandering teardrops of remorse, haunting crystalline flakes, and the children huddled, loved and warm in their sleeping yarns. At dawn, the crowing of prong-horned beetles, crimson in the detritus of the night, signals the solstice over, and trumpets quake the night hair gone, streaming behind wild and bright. The long, hard, dark veils some who never rise again, while others rejoice, refreshed from sleep, their hearts like silver raspberries, sweet and tender, falling into open mouths. Just feel the curlicues of spring, dormant now. With six moons turn away, this winter solstice will be no more acclaimed, for then the longest day unravel when summer solstice holds its sway. Well, following Amy's lead with the weird animals and some other people have been talking about birds and stuff, I have one called The Murmuration of Starlings. And um, it's really an amazing sight, so hopefully everyone here has had the experience of seeing this. One, my namesake, a chunky bird, making a four-pointed star, thousands soaring together. Two, pinwheels, pitchforks, incarnations, rivers of pepper floating in skies of blue. Dame Fortune bidding the stakes. Three, shivering, shaking the sky loose of thorns, plummeting as one like scimitars then gone. Four, silly humans, can't fly, never could. <laughs> the bloodiest fools staring upwards in envy. Five, the vinegar rises and they are impelled to answer. Nature is the simple reason. Sexual calling another. We don't know the truth. Six, search them out. N equals I-O-T-F-W-2. Proud together, I ship the same, pounds of it, filled with sand and pellets. Seven, from horizon to horizon, the vertical air beating against their wings and the sound of fluttering magnified to a boom as they launch ever higher. Eight, these bird brains, how do they communicate? Who is the leader? Why don't they bang into each other as they wheel in unison with such precision and speed? Nine, filled with passion and joy, they never stop to think about it. The slightest ripple and they drop into fields calling them home. 10, the starlings are in all the lost grain and even in the cities of late, creating havoc and chaos out of the whistle and shriek of beauty. 11, these are the seven things I wonder about. 
the snakes that flame before the total eclipse of the sun, the chartreuse of the aurora borealis, 12, the bottom half of a double rainbow, music and sounds that are conceived in the mind, river stones that keep a memory, 13, the bifurcation of light spiraling out of the blackest of holes and the murmuration of birds. Thank you. Um, and this is the last poem. It's called Solstice 2022 because I wrote it for you guys. <laughs> week. <laughs> this year is not like any other. Have you felt that? Something has moved or been moved. Something has been hidden or lost and we can't find it or even figure out what it is. I took a walk today at three in the afternoon. The sun made its appearance amidst the winter clouds. A bird's nest fell at my feet. A work of art fallen from the tallest branches. A perfect hollow of twigs and feathers. Like the palm of a hand holding the heart of a bird. I tramped through the mud of the fields singing my own song knowing that other parts of the world were faded into death, abandoned to cold, miseried in war. I could not hold all that sadness in my one body. I closed my eyes facing the sun, waiting for the earth to shift, to pour it all out into the rivers the rivers of time, to howl it out, waiting for the healing of solstice or maybe something else. The salvation of old mysteries, old bones needing to suffer and then to heal. The new year in its celestial oneness. of species, just throw that out there. <laughs> two short poems. The first one I wasn't sure if I should bring. Um, it's, it's very connected to this space, but it contains a secret. Um, and I wasn't, I've never read it before out loud or in public, and, but then I thought, well, this is, this is the space to read this poem. And um, some of you know that I, I'm a midwife assistant and a doula, so I, I'm with women when they um, give birth as a birth assistant. And, um, you know, when a woman gives birth, after she gives birth, there, there's the, this thing that we call the afterbirth or the placenta, which is an organ that a woman grows to nourish her child um, during her pregnancy. And, and most often that is just discarded and we don't think about it anymore. But um, some women uh, don't like to have sacred parts of their bodies discarded. And um, some of them, have brought the afterbirth actually here and um, buried them here. And um, this, is, this is a poem about um, the women's work um, honoring this 
this space and this land and also um, the work of, of her body of bringing new life into this world. So this poem is called Afterbirth. And it's a pan too. The parts of ourselves we no longer needed, buried at Glen Helen in secret, and the ordinary silence of trees. Only black cat chickadees announce our arrival in single repeating sighs. Nearby, water veins yellow-orange sediment along the rocks, and a screech escapes the throat of a great horned owl. And a screech escapes the throat of a great horned owl. Nearby, rocks yellowed by orange sediment veined with water, with single repeating sighs. Black cat chickadees announce our arrival when we buried parts of ourselves we no longer needed in secret at Glen Helen in the ordinary silence of trees. And this, thank you. Um, thank you for, for letting me read that one out loud. Um, this next poem um, is also actually an anthology. And um, I, my husband and I like to go to the Ark of Appalachia. We've stayed in the Airbnbs there a few times. And one of the times that I was there, I had this memory that my father took me to the caves when I was a child. And I, had the, I remember going into these caves and um, I found out when my husband and I were there that they had shut off the lights, that the caves were no longer tourist caves. And um, I started thinking about that darkness and how important that dark space was to return you know, that space, the cave, um, to, the, to, to, to the darkness, which is really where um, the real light is. So this poem is called A Litany to Our Lady of Destabilization. <laughs> As unto the tourists at the caves and the rock-run wilderness, restored after 80 years of continuous fluorescent light, forgive us. For park gift shops selling lucky crystals and packs of gum, our relentless pursuit of light. For how we of little faith thrust our hand into the wound of the world again and again, just to know it's real. Groundwater, salamander, isopod, moss, forgive us for the way our touch erases at the Chalet Naval, the snow trillium are beginning to bloom just as the frost is ending. Restore us to the darkness where we were formed, that penetrating stem of desire, how it pushes through the clay and blooms in full crown. Thank you. Maxine Scuba. Good evening. It's nice to be um, reading poetry and hearing it again. Uh, I feel like there's been a desert. Uh, so, I have two poems to share. The first one is called Into the Woods. The young man told me he could not kill anything, not even a fly. It had always been that way since he was a little boy. Once, he and his grandfather headed into the woods with guns. They would kill an animal. They would bring it home to the fire like cavemen and elders throughout time. That was what fathers and sons, grandfathers and grandsons still do. Manly things, bonding things. They both spied a deer grazing in a field nearby. 
The boy began to cry as the deer looked their way. He knew they would shoot it. Knowledge that made tears run down his cheeks. His grandfather bent down to share his secret. He had served in the war as a paratrooper. He hated the guns, the killing of life, the slaughter of innocents. They turned around then, headed for home. Having revealed their secrets to one another, two better people emerged from those woods. They had bonded in truth. The second one is a little bit lighter. I grew up on an island in Maine, and we weren't very politically aware of food other than fish and lobster. Of course, that was wonderful. But <clears throat> otherwise, we indulged. So this is called Lunch at Mary's House. It was an exotic event when I ate lunch at Mary's house. For the first time, I had sandwich spread relish sandwiches on squishy white bread with pickled pieces in it. It was tasty, and I asked for another one. Lunches there were varied. My favorite was sliced bananas with marshmallow fluff on Wonder Bread. I asked for seconds. <laughs> Freshly minted gourmands, we'd be stuffed and ready for canaster. Sometimes Mary's brother or sisters joined us. The two deck of decks of cards, old and frayed, felt solid in my hands when I discovered a red canaster. Then to my house for a bowl of coffee ice cream and a peek at the ocean to see what the tide had brought in. Between the sandwiches, the ice cream, and Mother Ocean, life felt awful good. <laughs> Thank you. Robin Malay, next, Robin. Correctly. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, what a wonderful night of poetry. And not only that, but I get to see a lot of my friends again I haven't seen for a long time. So thank you. Um, the other thing I don't wanted to say is I've heard the Ark of Appalachia tonight and Glen Helen. I belong to the Ark, um, and also to the Kilba, which is now part of the Ark as well, my way. And uh, it's just wonderful how these things are growing, preserving the land. It's just marvelous, and so I'm so happy. My poem tonight is, um, has to do with open air, but it also is a bit of a love story. Um, it's called Unseen, My Great Granddaughter in the Womb. In the peachy glow of the amniotic fluid, you float, tiny upturned nose, juicy lips, barely seen as you hold up your hands and feet, hiding from the world a little longer, wanting to keep that weightlessness, that warm safety, the muffled song of your mother's heartbeat. You are still consciousness, still wise in the ways of the universe until that jarring moment of birth of light and sound, when your first cry will erase all you've known before, and you come into the world empty, a clean slate waiting to be filled. I want to fill you up with the magic of this world, the plaintive cry of the first Phoebe of spring, the sound of wood frogs, their translucent egg cases in ephemeral vernal pools, the buzz of bees on blossoms. I want to take you deer counting in summer's dusk as we did your father, to teach you the names of birds, of trees, of wildflowers. I want you to know, even though this world can be dark, the tears will be shed, there's also this earth that holds you, grounds you, a womb like the womb of your mother, made green and alive by seed, like the seed of your father. You are the child, of the child of my child. 
And although I will not see you grow to womanhood, I will be there in the stardust that is in all of us. In the, school, in the cool dirt beneath your feet, you will feel me, a woman who loved the earth and who loved you. Thank you. Next up, Paula J. Lambert. I am so pleased to be here. This is probably my favorite reading series in my favorite reading venue in all of Ohio. <laughs> and it's a delight to be here again. It was a delightful reading again tonight. I'm pleased to have a poem in the anthology, which I'll read. But I have the experience of knowing this is probably the best place ever to read a vulture poem. <laughs> So I'm going to start with one of those. <laughs> uh, and this gets into Egyptian mythology here. This is what they imply by depicting a vulture. And the epigraph is, because in this race of, because in this race of creatures there is no male. That's from the hieroglyphics of Har Apollo. In the beginning, all was female. Bird begat bird begat bird, each impregnated by the wind, which was also female. In the beginning, vulture was goddess. For 120 days she was pregnant, and for 120 days she cared for her young, and for 120 days she cared for herself, preparing to ride the wind for the five remaining days of her year. Imagine being cradled by the breath of the world, levitating through lovemaking. Oh, imagine. In the beginning, we were worshipped, and in the beginning, we could fly, and in the beginning, we were loved by the air itself. In the beginning, we created, and in the beginning, sky bowed to us, and in the beginning, earth reached for us, and oh, in the beginning, we were holy. We were holy in the beginning, and can you imagine that? In the beginning, we were holy, we were whole. <laughs> and this is the poem that was in, it's in the anthology. It's, it's from This How to See the, the Earth, which came out in 2020, and I was writing my way through that very difficult um, year. This, I wrote this in the spring of 2020, trying to absorb all that was in the news. And of course, every, every day I'm still trying to absorb all that's in the news. But this is called What's Not in Our Nature. Still blind honey guide chicks, newly hatched from their shells, use perfectly pointed beaks to puncture any eggs still left in the nest. Carnivorous shrikes impale their prey on any spike they can find. The whole world watched on a live stream cam where a Pittsburgh peregrine falcon fed one dead hatchling to one that survived. I mean, we'd rather not know the ways of the wild where our hungry hearts might lead. We see a bird soar and call it free, fight for the right to live the same way, knowing peace means nothing to parasite that might on its own never yields to mercy. We see ourselves as songbirds only, but given the hunger, given the cause, given our driving fear, we wake up singing in the morning sun what just doesn't jibe with the nightly news. It helps not to turn away from the world, to see with grace these gifts were given, the will to live, this want to rise. Thank you. several times over the past year. Um, up next, Jim Brooks. Jim. One of a few Jim Brookses in the area. Um, yes, I too am promoting this book. <laughs> So 
start with that based on a true story about one of my student slash tennis players. Till the cows come home. It started when a neighbor kid spooked six bovine into leaping a fence that one thought only a trained thoroughbred could have hurdled in a steeplechase. The owner summoned his teenage son to fetch them, just as his father had done a generation before. At first, he snuck up, hoping to scare them toward their familiar field, but scattered them every which way over and over until he thought they were laughing at him. The next afternoon, he found them a mile away, tried to run with them, only to find that months of football conditioning couldn't give him the heart of a heifer. <laughs> Hay was his next enticement, but they could easily munch and keep a wary eye on him. Besides, last fall's crop had lost its sweetness and could be ignored for April's fresh pastures. He lay in bed that night, his mind searching other solutions, cherry bombs, lariats, hideous disguises, and country music to rein in the wandering Angus. Next day, the sheriff called, retrieve them or they will be shot. He knew they weren't fattened for slaughter. With all the waning confidence he could muster, he found and stood among them wearing his Packer's hat. For half an hour, he did nothing more than breathe. And when he turned toward home, they followed their silent piper, content to be penned once more. And on the 25th of this month is one of those high holy days that some of us celebrate. In search of a birthplace. They are homeless when a home is most needed, still wandering when fatigue sets in like a rising fever. She on a beast like one the child would later ride into Jerusalem, and he the stable encouraging presence in every step. It will be soon, he says, with false confidence. Someone will say yes. They seek shelter beneath emerging constellations that breathe upon their quiet, desperate journey to an obscure destination off a beaten path called Bethlehem. Others will follow and witness the everyday miracle of a woman giving birth to an extraordinary child whose first cry will be an eternal word dwelling in human flesh. <laughs> okay, we're going to round it out. Uh, penultimate reader, Karen Scott. We also have to thank Karen for bringing Rose to the venue. Sorry, I didn't get her here sooner. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to read on the open mic, but like a good poet, I had thrown my reading file in the car, and my daughter graciously went out and got it for me. So I will be reading three. The first one is Notice Me. I like loud, brassy birds, the rusty pump call of blue jay, the mad woman laugh of robin, the gronk and drumming of woodpecker, trill of red-winged blackbird at the nearby pond, all say, hear me. I love overwhelmingly fragrant flowers, the perfume of honeysuckle vines, panicles of lilac scenting the evening air, the heavy, humid aroma of magnolias, cloying sweetness of hyacinth and Easter lilies that grab you by the nose and say, I am here. My substantial size, the color of my skin, my natural hair, my jewelry, the earrings, bracelets, rings, necklace that I feel naked without, my Yellow Springs t-shirts begging to be read, my ever-present smile all say, look at me, while my true inner self whimpers, 
don't. <laughs> and the one that I have in the anthology is called Circle. First basic shape we see, bottle nipple, rattle handle, bouncy ball, wagon wheels, bicycle tires, the wheels on the bus go round and round, circles within circles, ripples on a pond, the sun and its after image, the moon, its diffused edge, pupil and iris, center of your eye, egg slices decorating potato salad, Circles and cycles, Krebs cycle, water cycle, photosynthesis, life cycles of flora and fauna, all around us, circles in motion, the earth rotating on its axis, the moon orbiting earth as they both revolve around the sun, creating tides and seasons of the year, phrases, phases of the moon, one year becomes another, the old one ends, the new begins, a never-ending cycle. An Oribus, great snake, eating its tail, devouring and being reborn from itself. Renewal, regeneration, infinity. And the last one is called Taming My Wild. <coughs> Excuse me. Eugene sucks his teeth, eyes my overgrown shrubbery. Sure you don't want me to trim those up for you? I'll do a good job. No thanks, I'll trim them when I get around to it. I just need you to mow the front yard. That's how the months of June and July pass with this weekly back and forth. Why is everyone so intent on taming my wild? If the kids on their way to school and back could be trusted to keep their mitts off my stuff and their butts out of my yard, I might be tempted to turn the whole thing into a wildflower meadow, much to the chagrin of my next door neighbor, who peeked over the stockard fence, motioned over the backyard, and remarked, I like this forest thing you got going here. <laughs> but when I joked that I should get a pygmy goat for lawn care, he shook his head, please. No goats. <laughs> I like driving into the alley and watching all the flora and fauna presenting themselves like denizens of a, of a Disney movie. I love my independent neighborhood where I don't have to rush out and mow my lawn just because Michael or Sam did. Where my neighbor to the northwest is free to cover his front yard with a Christmas light display he spends over a year building and tweaking where we are free to individualize our properties that we're paying on in any way we see fit within reason. Conformist daughter of a military man, I have struggled to find ways to distinguish myself from others. Please don't try to tame my wild. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. That is the first poem in the new anthology that we released. And the last reader for this evening, Alex Scott. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a couple. The first one's really short. And also, also um, if you didn't know already, I bet you can't guess which poet here is my mom. <laughs> this is called Winter. Snow tumbles down from rooftops, spurred on by harsh winds. Darkness creeps into our daytimes too early, and the music seems too quiet. The day is too cold for dancing in the sun. Hearts go into hibernation. Some bright souls decide this mortal plane is too icy and dull to sustain the wonder of existence and drift away into endless sunshine. The rest of us left to feel the chill deep into our bones and never feel quite as warm again. Um, the next one is in the anthology as well, and um, hopefully it's a little bit less of a downer. <laughs> and this is, for, um, this is written for my best friend, Meredith. Um, she was here with me when I went to Antioch, and she passed away in 2013. Um, it's called Roots. <clears throat> I burn OSHA root, and it smells like Antioch. Reading for poetry class, sprawled across spotty green lawns, 
whispers of lavender and blue dream punctuating our laughter. We talk about science, we only know as much as classrooms allowed. We've always been told that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred or transformed. And I have wondered whether this rule fetters the soul. You are a star in my sky now. I search for you on cloudless nights. I sometimes hear you in the sound of my own footsteps or the silence of a snow-covered forest. Some days, even in the song of birds that congregate on the windowsills. Not long after you left, our best friend cried over her cup as she told me, we're all just like the cream and sugar and coffee, swirling around, around, with no control, until we just disappear. And I asked her, isn't that what makes life beautiful? We are the sugar that cuts the bitterness and makes it sweet. The fleeting nature of life, like cream, makes it all the more rich. And I think of myself like tissue, healing improperly around a picked out wound. I think far too often on loss, how it fosters fear of the future, has left empty spaces where my wholeness should be. But I find sharing grief brings us a little closer together, causes us to hold on a little tighter, check in a bit more often, turn the uncontrolled twirling into a dance, make sure the world will remember who we are. Thank you.